Good evening, Zion. You belong here, we belong together. I'm Pastor Dwayne Jesse, pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Youngstown, Ohio, and this evening we are observing Holy Thursday, the infamous night that Jesus was betrayed. It is my opinion that this night is the holiest event on the church's calendar. And I say that because on that night, there was still time for Jesus to change his mind. He knew what lay ahead of him, as the gospel reading from John will reveal, and yet he went on to do what only he could do, and he had to do it alone. But before Jesus and the Twelve left the upper room, he had one final act to demonstrate for them and one final commandment to give to them. That is what this evening is about. And so, due to the solemnity of this evening, I'm going to dispense with the announcements and the thank yous, except to remind you that our Good Friday service is only available online, and it will post about 3 p.m. on Friday, the traditional time that Jesus Christ died. Please join us to celebrate that most solemn event on the church's calendar. Now I invite you to join in a time of silent reflection and then our time of confession and forgiveness. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we were called at baptism. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this day, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter into the celebration of the great three days reconciled with God and with one another. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment in our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to John. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, 
took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around them. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. As you know by now, this Lent, my colleagues and I have been guiding you through this best-selling book, The Book of Joy, by the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, as a way of offering a midweek meditation. Well, tonight we continue, only you just get me, and tonight our pillar of joy is forgiveness. Fitting, I think, on this Holy Thursday. Archbishop Tutu and the Dalai Lama begin the chapter reminding us of courageous stories of forgiveness. The South African woman who learned of her son's death as she witnessed his body being dragged through the streets on television and was later able to say to her son's murderers, my child, my child, I forgive you. We are reminded of the story of Nelson Mandela who was imprisoned for 27 years for trying to end apartheid in South Africa. And yet upon his release, knew that if he did not forgive his jailers, he would remain imprisoned to bitterness and hatred. Perhaps you know of such heroic acts of forgiveness. I can recall the mothers of the victims of the Charlottesville Church Massacre, for example, on live TV at the arraignment of the killer of their loved ones saying to his face, one by one, we don't know you, but we forgive you. Archbishop Tutu and the Dalai Lama share our awe for such moments and offer six principles of forgiveness for our consideration. Number one, no one is unforgivable. Forgiveness begins where scripture begins. All of us are made in the image of God and we are all beloved children of God. In the same way that we have within us the capacity for sin, we have within us the capacity to repent and to seek forgiveness. Christ died not for a chosen few, 
but so that all humankind might be forgiven. Thus, no one is outside the reach of God's love and God's grace. And no one made in the image of God is beyond redemption and repentance. Number two, no one is incapable of forgiving. In the same way that we are all forgivable as God's image bearers, we are also capable and indeed called to forgive in the same way that we are forgiven. Not once, not twice, but over and over again. I recall the parable of the unforgiving servant who, in response to his own forgiveness by his master, refused to forgive those indebted to him and thus finds himself in prison to torment. The lesson here is that we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. Number three, forgiveness does not mean we forget or that we allow ourselves to be harmed again or that we accept or approve of wrongdoing or that we stop seeking justice. Forgiveness is not about allowing harm to continue, nor about keeping ourselves bound to relationships or situations that are dehumanizing or oppressing. As the Dalai Lama emphasizes, we must stand firm against wrongdoing and even take counteraction to put a stop to it. But we must not develop anger or hatred toward the perpetrator. Forgiveness does not mean that we sit idly by or throw up our hands against those individuals or even against the system that does us harm. We must not allow the sin of others to incline our hearts toward hatred. As Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, loving one's enemies does not mean that I must like them. But it does mean we must never stop striving to see the image of God within them and thus hold open the door to the possibility of redemption. It's important also to note that forgetting typically refers to the work of reconciliation, which is different than forgiveness. Reconciliation is about both parties taking action to heal a rift or a wound. Forgiveness is a unilateral act, something you do in your own heart without the need for an action from the other person. Forgiveness is a vital step toward the possibility of reconciliation because it begins to lay the foundation for the renewal of relationship. But it should not be confused with reconciliation, nor should it be ignored in cases where reconciliation is not seen as possible. Number four, forgiveness is born of compassion. As the Dalai Lama argues, if we can bring ourselves to have a sense of concern for the well-being of those who have harmed us, then there is no place for anger or hatred to grow. Finding our way to compassion for those who have done harm to us helps us rehumanize them and see them once again, not as our enemies, but as fellow bearers of the image of God, who have somehow become so damaged and distorted along the paths of their lives that they commit such terrible acts that we might lose sight of their humanity. Compassion helps us to see them anew as the person that God made them to be, rather than the sum of their sin, and in so doing, find our way to forgiveness. However, we must be careful to distinguish that this does not mean that we are excusing their sin or wrongdoing. Compassion and forgiveness do not equate to reconciliation or redemption. It merely helps us keep the door open to the possibility. Similarly, finding our way to compassion does not equate to forgetting, but merely reminds us of their humanity, 
and in so doing helps us to hold on to ours and to the ultimate hope of reconciliation. Number five, forgiveness is the only way to heal ourselves and be free from the past. Without forgiveness, we remain tethered to that person who has harmed us and bound us with chains of bitterness. Until we forgive those who harm us, we give them the keys to our happiness and will remain the jailer of our joy. When we forgive, we take back control of our own fate and our own feelings and become our own liberators. As Nelson Mandela famously put it, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Forgiveness puts us on the path of health and wholeness, which makes us strong enough to become a force for positive change and reconciliation. We cannot love our neighbors as long as we are imprisoned by our resentment of them. Number six, forgiveness is a sign of strength, not weakness. There was perhaps no moment when the Dalai Lama became more adamant or more animated than at his insistence that forgiveness is never a sign of weakness. Totally wrong, 100% wrong, 1000% wrong. Forgiveness is a sign of strength, the Dalai Lama insisted. Forgiveness is the courage to break the human cycle of resentment and revenge. The natural response when someone hits us is to hit them back. But true courage is when we have the strength to unilaterally disarm, realizing that an eye for an eye will eventually make the whole world blind. As Archbishop Tutu added, those who say forgiveness is a sign of weakness haven't tried it. So, how can we practice forgiveness? I'm so glad you asked. Jesus commanded us to pray for our enemies. Likely, they are the ones who have harmed us. There is probably no simpler place to begin the journey of forgiveness than prayer. We don't need to forgive those who have harmed us yet. Let us begin just by praying for them. Try to see them as fellow children of God who share many of the same hopes and fears that we all do and who suffer and act out of suffering just as we all do. Notice if after a few days or weeks of praying for them, if the door to forgiveness doesn't begin to open. Well, today is Holy Thursday. For me, Holy Thursday is arguably the most sacred, most holy day on the liturgical calendar. And the reason I say that is because our Lord Jesus, it is still not too late for him. He knew everything that was about to happen to him. He will be betrayed by one of his own abandoned by all the rest of his disciples. His own country folk he came to minister to will yell for crucifixion. And the crucifixion, the method of capital punishment reserved for the worst of the worst of humanity because of its brutality, will be carried out by Gentiles, people whom Judaism considered unclean. And yet, he left the safety of the upper room and allowed all this to happen to him. Why did he do it? Because as we have discussed, all through the Sunday services of Lent, humankind has proven to be incapable of loving God back through our obedience. The sin of humankind's disobedience caused the gate to the Garden of Eden to be closed, and it would have remained closed if God didn't do something. Thankfully, God is defined by love and created us and all there is out of love, 
And so God's new covenant with humankind was meted out by the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. By his death on the cross, the once and done sacrifice for all sin has been made and our sin is forgiven. The only responsibility we have in this new covenant is to accept his forgiveness and commit to remembering the cost he willingly bore to win it for us. In the gospel reading for this evening, Jesus told his disciples that his example is how they are to behave in his kingdom if they are to remain his disciples. And then he gave them this new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. I presume that he meant loving one another within the fellowship of the faith. But I would like to extend that to any other person and to especially those who have harmed us. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, loving one's enemy does not mean I have to like them, but it does mean that we must never stop striving to see the image of God within them. Thank God Jesus Christ saw the image of God in us. Let us pray. Crucified and risen Lord, on this holy night, we are reminded of the forgiveness you won for us at such a great cost. Oh, how you loved us. Let the memory of this love, this great cost, be ever present on our minds so that we are motivated to forgive others with the forgiveness we ourselves have received from you. We pray this in your name. Amen. United by the servant love of God in Christ, we pray this holy night for the needs of the world. Blessed are you, O God, for the church. Strengthen your people gathered around the globe on this holy day in homes, in churches, and outside under your sky. Bless the church's deacons and all congregational ministries. Give us hunger for your word and joy in receiving it. Feed us all our tables with your blessings. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Blessed are you for this good earth. Cleanse and protect the water you have given for our drinking and our washing. Sustain crops and herds that provide our food. Teach us how to live so that there is enough for all. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Blessed are you for our nation. Lead us out of ancient patterns of prejudice. 
protect all people throughout the world who flee violence and oppression. Establish wise and just leadership in every place and peace where there is violence and war. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Blessed are you for caring for the needy. Feed the hungry. Give jobs to the unemployed. Embrace all who are isolated and lonely. Comfort those living with guilt and those who mourn. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Blessed are you for accompanying the sick. Bring an end to this pandemic and restore healthy and hearty connections between persons. Empower medical personnel. Receive our prayers for those on our prayer list, our homebound, and those we now name before you, either silently or aloud. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Blessed are you for serving us, we who are your servants. Receive now, we pray, our silent petitions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Blessed are you for generations of the faithful who have proclaimed our Lord's death and lived in service to others. Unite us with them in hope until we join with them at your everlasting banquet. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Hear these and all our prayers, O God, in the name of the one who loves us to the end. Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Return to the Lord your God, for God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and abounding in steadfast love. Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal, that we may pass over from death to life. With Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks and praise, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this night instituted a ritual meal that he commanded we do as often as we gather. So we never forget the price he was willing to bear, so that we may come to you, our Heavenly Father. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. The Apostle Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord that what I also handed on to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Reveal yourself to us, O Lord, in the breaking of the bread, as you once revealed yourself to your disciples. For those of you worshiping at home, it is about time for you to take part in Holy Communion. During the time of your partaking, I want you to watch a slideshow that we've put together of pictures taken of the rest of us communing during the pandemic. It is my hope that these faces will look familiar and comforting to you. You belong here. We belong together. We can hardly wait to see each other and look at each other face to face. Now, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Oh, oh. 